Back-to-back -back Nats. Perfection wears red and black tonight. 15-0, the dogs have done it and won a second consecutive national title. Several teams have gone back-to-back -back in college football, but no modern era program has had a three-peat. The Georgia Bulldogs are favored to do just that this season, despite having to replace several key players, including the most important piece, Stetson Bennett, finally out of eligibility, and Carson Beck, who committed to Georgia as a four-star four years ago, is his likely replacement. I don't think people give Carson enough credit for being a good athlete. He was a really good baseball player. He has great movement skills. While Georgia is once again the clear-cut number one, their number one contender has this year's top recruiting class. Alabama couldn't win at all, even with Bryce Young, so it's next man up in Tuscaloosa. But no one is certain who that next man will be. This this is the biggest sign of vulnerability I've seen from Alabama in several years. You had two quarterbacks, four-star caliber or higher, that you handpicked, and you come out of spring and admit to yourself, we don't have either one of them as ready as we want to have them, to the point where we got to go get Notre Dame's backup quarterback. I can do this in my sleep. I can do this in my sleep. If you're looking for quarterback answers, look west. That's where Caleb Williams will begin his quest for back-to-back -back Heisman trophies. He's also the likely number one pick in next year's draft. But his main objective is trying to get his USC Trojans back to the pinnacle of the sport. My goals for this year is to go out there and be the best player that I can be for these guys, be the best teammate that I can be, help out wherever I can with any of my teammates, and go 1-0 every week. While USC represents the Pac-12's best chance at reaching the playoff, the most intriguing story out west is in Boulder, where we have no idea what Dion's Buffaloes are going to look like after he sent nearly every player into the portal. I have a certain approach, and I don't fluctuate from that. And I want what I want, and I'm going to get what I want. In the Midwest, our eye is on the Big Ten as the conference heads to CBS. Jim Harbaugh has made Michigan the favorite because his newfound success against his rivals from Columbus. Compare us to any other program, it doesn't get any better. Compare us to perfect, and we're going to come up short. And that's what we keep striving for. We keep chasing that perfection. While Michigan-Ohio State might be the biggest game of the season, there are plenty of great non-conference clashes kicking things off. Like those Buckeyes heading to South Bend to face the Fighting Irish. And Texas going to T-Town in a rematch of last year's great battle between the Horns and Tide. College football is coming. It sure is coming, Chris. Just 100 days away from the first full college football Saturday. We got the dogs looking for a 3 P. Georgia with the best odds to win it all this season. Bama, Penn State, USC, Coach Prime, and Colorado. So many storylines, and we're wondering who is going to make it to the CFP this go around. A couple of big matchups for week one on the slate. We got a neighboring state rivalry with South Carolina and North Carolina on neutral ground, so to speak, in Charlotte, Virginia, and Tennessee, Ohio State and Indiana, Big Ten matchup there, Middle Tennessee and Bama, and then West Virginia and Penn State. And we have Brian McFadden and Tom Fernelli joining us here on HQ to dive into these matchups because it's never too soon. And guys, a number of big-time programs are looking for a new starting QB this season, including Alabama, a pretty crowded uh, QB room that Saban is managing there. Week one against Middle Tennessee. With that dynasty potentially in question for Bama, um, who do you think is the best fit to fill the shoes of Bryce Young, Tom? You know, it's it's a difficult question to answer, and I know that for a fact because Nick Saban is having difficulty answering the question. They went into the offseason with Jalen Milrow, who had some playing time last year when Bryce Young was out with injury and experience. He was one of the comp competitors for the job. They had five-star backup Ty Simpson competing for the job, and neither one of them won it during the spring, so much so that Notre Dame, with or they went to Notre Dame and got Ty Buckner, who was the starter for the Irish last year before he got hurt and has familiarity with new Alabama offensive coordinator Tommy Reese. So we're heading into the summer, 
and we don't know who the starter is going to be. We probably will not know until week one when all three, I would suspect, will get some playing time in an opening game against Middle Tennessee. And I think it's somewhat indicative of where Alabama is as a program right now in that You know, it's somewhat going through an identity crisis. Georgia has won the last two national titles. And while I'm not going to sit here and proclaim that the Alabama dynasty is dead, they had the number one pick in the draft in Bryce Young at quarterback the last two seasons. They didn't win a national title either of those years. And now we're going into another season in which they don't even know who their quarterback's going to be. This is the most questionable I have found Alabama to be in a very long time under Nick Saban, probably since his first year in the program. So I think going into 2023, there are a lot more questions than answers about Crimson Tide right now. Hearing Alabama and identity crisis is something that we're certainly not used to hearing, Tom. Um, But a team that knows who their starting QB is. We're going to move on to Texas. Quinn Ewers, he's under center there. Uh, and Texas, they get Rice week one. And then in week two, we get that epic rematch with, of course, Bama. Do you think the Longhorns, BMAC, could knock off Bama on the road? And I'm interested in your answer because, BMAC, you had said earlier on HQ that the only thing that Texas does consistently is disappoint their fans. No question. I think their fans would agree with me in that statement in what we've seen in years past. But to answer your your first question, no question, yes. I believe the Longhorns, after taking care of their business against Rice, you don't want to overlook Rice. But when you talk about this big-time matchup, week two, traveling down to Alabama, yes, they got more than a fighting chance, and here's why. Tom just talked about the concerns for Alabama at the quarterback position. That is a huge concern to have because the quarterback is the most most important position on your football team. The same is is not stated in regards to Texas. They know who their signal caller is. Quinn Ewers, Ewers, a overly talented guy, and one would say if he was healthy the entire ball game a year ago, they probably would have beaten Alabama last year in Austin. You look at the strides this team has made. In 2021, they were five and seven. 2022, a year ago, eight and five. This has to be their year, not just about beating Alabama, but getting back into that national championship conversation, the playoff conversation, because they have talent, they have quarterbacks. Even though they lost Bijan Robinson, Jonathan Brooks is there, Keelan Robinson, Xavier Worthy, one of the best wide receivers in the Big 12. So they have talent there. So me personally, not knowing exactly what the situation will be for Alabama currently at the quarterback position, Yes, I think that the the Texas Longhorns have more than a fighting chance to knock off Alabama in week two. All right, another rivalry for week one. We have South Carolina and UNC in Charlotte, a neutral side game to open up their seasons. People in Chapel Hill, they're pumped because obviously they got Drake May as their QB and then Gamecock fans, Tom, uh, some high expectations there as well after seeing that South Carolina team and how they performed against Clemson in Tennessee last season. Yeah, this is a really important season for both of these programs in 2023, and I think having this game to start the year is a huge game for both of them that could kind of determine how the year is going to go. Starting with South Carolina, Shane Beamer is going into his third season with the Gamecocks, won seven games in year one, improved to eight wins last year. But there, you, need, you look around the division right now, and Georgia is obviously the class of college football, but we saw in the SEC East last year, Tennessee take a step forward, although South Carolina did beat Tennessee. But we also saw Florida, one of South Carolina's other primary competitors, take a step backwards. So if you are South Carolina and you want to mirror what Tennessee was able to do last season with Spencer Rattler in his final season at quarterback and take that step forward. You want to go out and beat North Carolina in this very first game of the season, especially because after they play Furman in week two, they've got a road trip to Georgia looming in week three. So if they lose this game, there is a very good chance that they're going to be staring one and two in the face to start the year. And that is not the kind of vibe you want coming out of September. As for North Carolina, Mac Brown's been there for a few years and honestly, I haven't really been all that impressed with what North Carolina has done since Mac Brown returned. When he's done very good on the recruiting trail, originally Sam Hartman, a highly rated quarterback he was able to snatch from Florida State and bring to Chapel Hill, but didn't win a lot of games. They never won more than eight games with him. They have Drake May now going into the season, and there were teams sniffing around him in the transfer portal during the offseason, but he stayed. But even with that, North Carolina won nine games last year. Duke 
won nine games last year. Mac Brown was not brought back to North Carolina to win as many games as Duke was, and he has what could possibly be the number one quarterback in the country. I think it's Caleb Williams, but nobody would be shocked if Drake May is the first QB taking in the draft next spring. So for North Carolina, they've had the offense. They've had the quarterbacks. Can they figure out their defense? Can they win more games than nine? Can they compete for an ACC title? I think this will be a good litmus test against what I expect to be a solid SEC squad in week one that could give us a nice you know, glimpse of what the Tar Heels are going to be in 2023. All right. Speaking of the SEC, Tennessee, it seems like their stock is on the rise after the season that Josh Heupel and his crew had last year. Beating Bama, we can't forget that, rushing the field. They're now transitioning from Hendon Hooker under center to Joe Milton at quarterback there. So they open the season with Virginia. And BMAC, do you think last season was maybe just a flash in the pan for Tennessee, or do you think they're going to build upon that success that we saw last year? Well, Jacqueline, I think what we saw a year ago was clearly – a surprise in regards to how fast they were able to get to uh, the success they had last year. They beat LSU, they beat Florida, they beat Bama, they beat Clemson all in the same year. And one would think if their quarterback stayed healthy and Hendon Hooker potentially getting into the playoffs was clearly a realistic option for them. Being 11-2, and two, I think they kind of reached that level faster than many people believe they would reach it, but now they're there. So the expectations are are to continue to de develop and give the same production they gave in 2022. Now they will have to do so without Hendon Hooker. Joe Milton is slated to be the starting quarterback. This is a guy that has a lot of experience in college football, threw for almost 1,000 yards last year, 10 touchdowns while leading the Vols to an Orange Bowl victory over Clemson, as you see there on your video. They lost some NFL talent at the wide receiver position, but one thing I like about Tennessee, they've done a great job recruiting the skill position. Not to mention the running back production. Get this, every productive runner from the backfield is returning. Over 2,000 yards of running production along with 29 rushing touchdowns that they will have the luxury of returning to the in the backfield behind Joe Milton. So yes, the expectations should be extremely high. When you look at the SEC East, yes, it's about Georgia. But then everything else is watered down in regards to consistency and production. So you have to like the, the, the likes of the Vols being able to be competitive in the SEC, especially in the East, to really find a way to get double-digit wins, most importantly, and find a way also to get into that playoff conversation. And going from the SEC to the uh, Big Ten, Drew Alar, he's going to make his first start uh, for Penn State as their quarterback against West Virginia. Tom, how much of a contender do you think the Nittany Lions are in the Big Ten with Alar under center there? I mean, I think this is a debut Penn State fans have been waiting years for as they've been sitting at Drew Alar sitting on the bench wondering why. Why can't we put our five-star on the field to see what happens? But I, I think that with Alar, I don't want to disrespect Sean Clifford because I think Sean Clifford was somebody who never quite got as much respect as he deserved. He was a fifth-round pick of the Green Bay Packers for a reason. The guy can play quarterback. But when you watched Penn State's offense, even with them, there just seemed to be a cap on what they were able to do, and they weren't the most prolific passing attack around. And when you look at what Ohio State has been doing in the Big Ten East for years with its passing attack, you look at the steps forward Michigan has taken in the last couple of years winning the division and winning the conference, Penn State's kind of felt a little stuck in the mud. But I do think with Drew Alar, who is the most talented quarterback Penn State has had in a long time, this is a team that when you combine it with their defense, which is a one once again, going to be one of the best units in that conference, can compete with Ohio State, can compete with Michigan. Will they win the division? I don't know. It's tough to beat both of those teams, but I do think they're going to be more competitive this year than we've seen them in recent seasons. And I think Alar is a big reason why, because they can do things in the passing game with him that they just weren't able to do with Sean Clifford. No quarterback from Penn State has finished in the top three of yards per game passing for since the 2017 season. That was Trace McSorley. That was also the last year Ohio State had JT Barrett at quarterback before we went to the Justin Field, CJ Stroud era of which we've seen that offense really take a step forward. This could be a year where Drew Alar is the most prolific passer in the in the conference. And if that is the case, Penn State will be competing for a Big East title. So it's going to be a very interesting thing to watch with the Nittany Lions. All right, let's talk about Ohio State entering this season, maybe with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, looking to avenge the losses to Michigan and Georgia at the end of the season. Uh, and BMAC, they're jumping right into Big Ten play in week one with Indiana. What are your expectations for the Buckeyes? Well, once again, 
I expect to see a team that will dominate within their conference. And the biggest question mark for them is Michigan, a team that has had the upper hand on Ohio State. But outside of their schedule and questioning their schedule, I think you have to figure out what's going to happen at the quarterback position, right? No longer C.J. Stroud is there. You have Kyle McCord and Devin Brown. But get this, on an average, right, on an average, the three new Buckeye starting quarterbacks since Ryan Day arrived in 2017 have completed at least 70% of their passes, thrown for over 4,000 yards, 45 touchdowns. That has been the known, that has been the consistent, those have been the consistent numbers for the new starting quarterbacks that have replaced the previous guy. So no pressure on Kyle, no pressure on <laughs> Devin, but that's just the standard. That has been the standard when you talk about seeing the likes of uh, Dwayne Haskins, uh, seeing the likes of Justin Fields, and most recently, C.J. Stroud. When those guys jumped into the saddle as a starting quarterback, over 4,000 yards, 40-plus touchdowns, completing 70% of their passes. That has been the theme for the new starting quarterbacks under Ryan Day. So one would think we will see similar-like numbers for, from either Kyle or Devin, whoever is the starting quarterback week one, but it has, that has been the standard. And get this, they have no lack of talent when it comes to the wide receivers. So whoever the new quarterback is, they will have the luxury of throwing to two of the best wide receivers in college football, not to mention you talk about the running game, getting Henderson back and, and Mayan Williams back as well. You have to figure out what will happen at the offensive line positions with replacing three big-time starters from a year ago on that unit, but they have talent. So my expectation for Ohio State, taking care of their business in the Big Ten and, of course, finding a way to get over that hurdle that has really hampered them over the last two years in the Wolverines. Buckeyes with the second best odds to win the Big Ten, only behind Michigan. All right, we're going to talk about Bo Nix in Oregon. They're looking for a better week one this season than last season. We all remember the Ducks just getting absolutely just dominated by Georgia last season. It was, what, 49-3. to What's your level of confidence in this Oregon team, Tom? Well, I will say week one is a lot simpler. Going from Georgia to open the season to <laughs> Portland State, slight different schedule, probably better off because this is an Oregon team that I do expect will compete for the Pac-12, and I think this is a huge year for Bo Nix. I think he came back, A, to help the Oregon Ducks win the Pac-12 and get to the playoff, but also to improve his draft stock. Now, the question is, the offensive coordinator who got the most out of him last season, Kenny Dillingham, has since left for the Arizona State job. So it will be key for Bo Nix early in the season to play well. And this is an Oregon team that, if you look at the way their schedule breaks down, there is a very good shot that this team will be 5-0 and when it's heading to Washington in mid-October for a showdown, which will be one of the bigger games against Michael Penix and the Huskies in the Pac-12 this season. I do think the Ducks are going to be one of the top two teams in the Pac-12. I do think they're going to reach the Pac-12 championship. Can they win it? Well, we're going to have to wait a few more months to find that one out. All right, and one of the most talked about coaches in the offseason for college football, Coach Prime. We're all wondering if the Coach Prime experiment is going to work in Colorado. Their season starts against last year's national runner-up, TCU. BMAC, a lot of people are saying this is one of the best non-conference games on the schedule. Well, I think a lot of people are saying that because of the head coach for Colorado, as you mentioned. You talk about Deion Sanders prime time. There's a lot of camera flashing following him. And there will be a lot of cameras following and monitoring this game. But heck, they still got to fill out a roster, right? So they still have a lot to do before they get to this TCU game. But yes, this will be a big time game because number one, Sonny Dykes did a great job in being able to get the most out of his ball club. They have to replace some key contributors from a year ago, but the standard is the standard there. And for Colorado, we want to see exactly what Coach Prime can do on this stage. We want to see exactly will his guys be as successful as his former players were at Jackson State. So this is a big opportunity for Colorado and Deion Sanders. This is another big opportunity for Sonny Dykes and his, his ball club to be able to showcase and show the NFL, I mean, college world that, yo, we're here to stay. We, we have an opportunity to continue to be a, in this conversation, especially in the Big 12. So this is an opportunity for us to take advantage of a team that's trying to figure out who they are in regards to consistency and, and consistent playing on the football field. So yes, I can't wait to see this matchup, but a lot of people are not giving the, the Buffaloes a shot based on what happened last year. And of course the turnover with their current roster. But as you mentioned, Jacqueline, yes, this could be a big game, could be a prime time game 
basically solely because of Deion Sanders coaching his first game against TCU. All right, guys, and that brings us to our Geico 15. In 15 seconds, give us your bold prediction for week one of college football. Tom, we'll start with you. Oh, we were just talking about that TCU Colorado game. I have no idea how it's going to work long term for Dion. It could be very successful. It could not work. In week one against the team that reached the college football title game last year, I think Colorado is going to get blown out by TCU in that game simply because we don't know who, like BMAC was saying, the entire roster is different. They've brought an entire new team to the transfer portal. It'll be their first time playing together, and they're facing a team that reached the national title game. I don't think it's going to go well. I think TCU wins by at least 30. Mm. Ooh, my bold prediction for week one, I believe the best game when you look at all the week one matchups is with LSU in Orlando versus Florida State. And my bold prediction is this. This will be the first of two meetings between these two ball clubs. Yes, they will meet again during the playoffs. Book it. You heard it here first and print the T-shirts. This is the first meeting between LSU and FSU. January will be the second. BMAC, I'm shaking my head because I think this is like the second time in two weeks as a Florida Gator fan I've had to sit here and talk and listen to you talk and hype up uh, Florida State. So I'll just, get used you know, to it. I know, I know, I guess I'm going to have to get used to it. We'll see. But, you know, I'm obviously rooting against FSU because that's just in my DNA as a Gator fan. OK, BMAC, Tom Fornelli, thank you guys so much for joining us here on HQ. And of course, you can catch BMAC and Pat P on their podcast. All things covered in the latest episode, they're talking with Joey Porter about his son, Joey Porter Jr., being drafted by the Steelers and a lot of Steeler talk there. And then also you can hear Tom Fornelli on the Cover 3 podcast in the latest episode there. Cover 3's Bud Elliott is joined by Glenn West to talk all things LSU. You can download and follow both podcasts wherever you get your pods or you can scan that QR code.